normally I'm jumping around. I, uh, I was telling Will and uh, Tasha last night, by the way, we've, we've not known each other that long. We met at a conference or knew about each other at a conference in Hawaii uh, about a year and a half ago. And I've heard about this church and heard about him, but never had a chance to really be together. And when he called me several months ago and said, hey, would you, would you come up and uh, speak at our church? I didn't ask him anything. I said, yes because I wanted to come and see it myself and be here. And this is an amazing place and getting to spend time with them uh, last night. Uh, God's hand is on them. I don't know if you recognize that or not. God's hand is on Will and, and Tasha. God's hand is on this church. Amen. And, and you, all need to, you all need to protect that and to bless that and honor that and encourage that. And if anyone would ever try to come in here and try to mess with God's hand, I'd just tell you up front, that's, that's a losing battle. It's a losing battle. And uh, this is serious stuff. And, um, you know, what I would say to you, these will mention briefly about my, my story. I went to a church in Texas, running about 188, and uh, discouraged. They were in debt. Little tiny church. In fact, I'd been at a church in Florida that was a big church, around 600. And I had a good salary, had, had all the things that I could ever need, ever want, and uh, didn't want to move. But I'd been praying I wanted to reach more people for Christ. This, I wasn't happy. We, weren't, we were reaching people, but we weren't reaching as many as we could. And so he took me to a little church. And I thought, I thought I was being punished. I remember sitting out on the curb in front of our house, bawling my eyes out, crying to God, why are you punishing me? But see, little did I know that he was taking me to a place where I could reach thousands and even multiplied thousands on top of that. This, this book alone, the, uh, the ABCs of Financial Freedom, has sold over 400,000 copies. Now, this will surprise you. We don't make money off these books. We decided before it was ever published, we would give the royalties away to help other people. So it's not about, it's not, that's, that's not how we got debt free. No, we got debt free. This, this book tells the story of how our family got debt free. And this workbook tells you how you can do it. And I'm telling you, anybody can do it because you just apply God's principles. Well, that little church of 188 grew to over 7,000. We went from six acres, which we overbuilt it. We kept building buildings, and we got too big for the neighborhood. So we went and bought 100 acres. We eventually bought 50 more. So we ended up with a 150-acre campus. Uh, property and facilities valued at somewhere around $140 million, um, all paid for. And we did that just based on following God's principles of, of um, just applying His Word to our lives. So, so this is serious stuff, and, and I want to help you. But, but I want to say, here's what I want to start out today. And I'm going to have to move. Can I do that? I've never spoken like this, but the Lord is telling me to, I can't, I'm just not a standstill guy. Um, I want to answer two questions real quick, and I, I, I've got to preach quick, and you've got to listen quick, because we don't have a lot of time, okay? Um, I want to answer the question this morning, why dogs are smarter than humans. Okay. And then I want to answer the question, why we have financial problems. Okay. Now, I know some of you are going, that's exactly what I was praying about on my way to church. Why are dogs smarter than humans? I want to show you a picture. See this picture here? See the man here? And uh, it says, this is why the dog is happier. Aww. See, he's, the man's thinking about the, that new car he bought and the huge payment he's paying. By the way, the average car payment in America today is over $700 a month. Oh, wow. That's insane. And he's talking about, thinking about an upcoming business trip he's got to go on, and he's not sure about all the things he has to do. And then he's got that mortgage payment. They're living in too much house that uh, they really can't afford. And then he's thinking about saving for retirement, and, and he doesn't know if he's going to have enough. And, and then you notice the picture of the dog. And the, the, dog, the dog is just happy because he gets to hang out with his master. Hello. That's why dogs are happier than humans. See, a lot of us have missed it. Instead of hanging out with God and putting Him first in our life, Jesus said, Seek first my Father's kingdom and His righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. We don't do that. See, what we'd rather do is focus on the car and the plane and the house and all that. And that's why we're miserable. And if we could just get to the place where we say, God, I just, I just like hanging out with you. I just want to do what you want me to do. We were talking last night at dinner, and I told... I told um, Will and Tasha, I said, listen, you can hear Barry Cameron, but you need to listen to God. Yeah. That's right. And that's true for all of us. So that's why dogs are happier than humans. Let me, let me show you another picture of why we have financial problems. Look at this one. 
Money cannot buy happiness, but it's more comfortable to cry on a Mercedes than on a bicycle. <laughs> It's true, isn't it? Right? And that's why we have financial problems. Because, well, you know, life stinks. It's going to be hard anyway. So we might as well just go out and get that car, go on that vacation or whatever. I mean, I grew up in a home where my, my parents mismanaged their finances. And I can remember my dad said, well, I just had to get your mother away. We just had to go do something. We just had to go buy this. And it was like, no, you didn't have to do any of that. I want to share with you a verse. If you have a Bible, turn to 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 7. If you don't have a Bible, I'll quote it for you. This is a perspective verse. When we come to God's house, we get our perspective realigned. That's why sometimes when you come to church, it hurts. That's why sometimes when you come to church, you go, ouch. That's why sometimes when you come to church, you go, I, I, I really wasn't comfortable with what Pastor Will said today. That's good. God's realigning your perspective. 1 Timothy 6, verse 7. For we brought nothing into this world, and we'll take nothing out of it. I could really just say amen now and go sit down. And that's really all you need to know about finances. Come on. Everything you've got right now, those cars out there, that house you came from, all the possessions. Listen, it's just a matter of time. It's not, it's not going to be yours. It's not yours now. Come on. About a year and a half ago, I had total heart failure, and I told the story to them last night. I won't bore you with it, but flew home from a pastor's conference in the Bahamas, and my doctor lied to me and got me to go by the hospital to check, see if I had a blood clot in my legs. He said, it's just a test. It'll take five minutes. Got to the hospital, gave them my name. They didn't even ask me to fill stuff out. They said, go ahead and have that seat. I went over to sit down, and they go, Mr. Cameron, we're ready for you. And I knew something was crazy, and I went in there, and they laid me on this thing and ripped my shirt off and pulled the pads off the wall. I go, whoa, what are you doing? I said, sir, you're dying. I go, no, I'm not. No, you, you, you've got the wrong person. I, I just, I'm just hungry. I just want to go to dinner. And, and they said, sir, you're dying right now. And I said, I want my wife to come in here. And she stuck her head around the corner. And she said, honey, you're in trouble. I go, what's going on? She goes, your heart's failing. And they said, sir, they had, they had IVs in me now and had monitors going. Your heart's below 20 right now. Most people are dead. We're going to have to do something. I said, well, you're not touching my heart unless I talk to my cardiologist. The doctor said, I've got him on the phone right here. I had to get a pacemaker. And so now I have a pacemaker. And when I got that, I thought, oh, great. You know, I'll live forever now. The doctor said, oh, no, there's plenty of other ways you can die. <laughs> but you know what? When I was lying on that table and they said I was dying, I wasn't thinking about cars or houses or retirement or any of that stuff. It was over. You know, all I wanted was my two grandsons to be there so I could say goodbye. That's it. And I was at peace. Listen, friend, if you're chasing after all that stuff, you're wasting your time. You brought nothing into this world, you'll take nothing out. So you better pay attention to what God says about it if you want to enjoy it. Because, by the way, if you look down at verse 17 of 1 Timothy 6, it says, God gives us everything richly to enjoy. Yep. Yeah. Hello? Yep. Between the time we get here and the time we live, leave, God will give us all kinds of things that we can enjoy if we'll do it His way. Okay, we're on the same page? You got the right perspective? Yeah. Okay, here we go. Seven, seven best things I've ever learned about finances. We're going to go fast. Here's number one. Your understanding of where it all comes from will either keep it coming or cut it all off. Your understanding of where it all comes from will either keep it coming or cut it all off. You and I have to answer the question, who owns our stuff? Mm -hmm. All the stuff we got, I already told you, we didn't bring anything in, we didn't have to take anything out, so it belongs to somebody else. Who does it belong to? Psalm 24, 1 says, The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. That's right. It all belongs to God. It doesn't belong to us. I love what it says in Proverbs 17, 16. Solomon said, Of what use is money in the hands of a fool, since he has no desire to get wisdom? That's right, man. Oh, now you want the Texas translation of that? <laughs> yes, yes. God's saying, Why in the world would I give you any more money when you're acting like a fool what I already gave you? That's number one. Listen, if you think it's yours or you think it's your hands or your brain, by the way, all God would have to do this afternoon when you go home and take a nap is just touch one little molecule in your brain and make you a bubbling fool who couldn't even get out of bed anymore. Don't start thinking it's you. Don't. God is the one who enables us to do whatever we do. And we've got to acknowledge that because if we don't acknowledge Him, He's not giving us anymore. So that's number one. Here's number two. What you pursue will determine what you possess. What you pursue will determine what you possess. 
You say, it can't be that simple. It is that simple. Some of you are sitting next to somebody right now you pursued. Now, if you're not happy with that possession, that's a whole other sermon series. Okay? But it's true. If you like to be in shape, you possessed that this morning. If you like, on the other hand, ice cream and chocolate chip cookies and pepperoni pizza and all that, you possessed that this morning. It is that simple. What you pursue determines what you possess. And that's why Jesus said in Matthew 6.33, Seek first His kingdom and His righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Deuteronomy 8.18 says, Remember the Lord your God, for it is He that gives you the ability to produce wealth, and so confirms His covenant. In other words, you know who's responsible for what's in my wallet? Not me. Not man. God. God's the one who determines that. Yes. God's the one that determines favor upon someone's life or someone's ministry or someone's business. So number one, your understanding of where it all comes from will keep it all coming or cut it all off. Number two, what you pursue will determine what you possess. Here's number three, what you spend will always be more important than what you earn. Okay. Right. You know, if you always keep sp spending more than you earn, you'll never make enough. Right. You know that? Mm -hmm. yes. In fact, here's one for you. Most people in this room today are making more money right now than you've ever made in your entire life. And have you ever stopped and said, so why am I not ahead? Why am I not doing better than I am? Well, you're spending all that you make. You get a raise, you spend more. You get a raise, you spend more. You spend it all. I can teach every one of you in this room how to give yourself a raise this week. You go, what, what do I do? What do I do? Tell me the secret. Just don't spend all your money this week. <laughs> Seriously. Imagine, imagine this week, you, you don't spend all your money this week. And then the next week, you don't spend all your money. And then the next week, you don't spend all your money. And then the next week, hello? That's how it works. Yep. Don't spend all your money. And did you know the Bible says that's what we're supposed to do? Proverbs 13, 18 says he, he ignores... Um, Discipline comes to poverty and shame, but he who heeds correction is honored. you got to discipline yourself to not spend all of your money. That's what I do. Christmas is coming up. You know where I always give money to my daughters to buy for my wife. And my wife buys for everybody else in the family. And you know where every Christmas gift always comes? Not out of our checking account, not out of savings. It comes out of my wallet. Money that I don't spend. I never spend all my money. Ever. And I learned that years ago. My wife and I, when we were getting out of debt, we got out of debt 21 years ago. We actually started 23 years ago. We tell that story in the book. You ought to read it. I never wanted to be an author. I never wanted to read a book. But we got up and shared this story with our church when we were getting out of debt, which that's kind of scary. Preach a sermon series you're working on yourself. Right. You know, stand up in front of a whole congregation and say, we're getting out of debt. And if you don't, what are you going to look like, right? right. But we did. And people heard those tapes. That was back when you had cassette tapes. They said, you got to put this in a book. People need to, I don't, want, I don't know how to write a book. And since then, we've done three books on, on finances. And, but that's the whole story of how we did it. And how we did it was by applying these principles and by not spending all of the money that we made. And, and my wife and I both got on a budget where she only got a certain amount of money for all the things she had to spend during a week. And I only got a certain amount of money. So guess what? When we got out of debt... Guess how many times we multiplied the money that we get each week? Twice? Four times? So you're debt free now. You can do anything you want, right? Ten times? We're on the same budget today that we were when we were getting out of debt. You want to know why? We found out we didn't need all that money. Found out we could live without it. You've got to learn to spend less than you make. And if you'll do that every week, You'll give yourself a raise every week. Here's number four. Your obedience will determine your abundance. Your obedience will determine your abundance. Now, what does that mean? Well, it means you've got to do what God says if you want to have what God has. See, a lot of people think, well, okay, I'll, I'll do what God says about the financial stuff, but, but, you know, I don't have to apply what He says about the marriage stuff, or what He says about relationship stuff, or what He says about child-rearing stuff, or what He says about business. No, no, you have to do what God says about all of it. So I don't know all of it. Well, guess what? That's why you need to be here next week. Because God gives 
pastors as gifts to the church. Ephesians chapter 4, read it, verses 11 and 16. The pastor is a gift to the church. It's not a hired hand, not an employee. He's a gift to the church. You know why? Because he's going to give you the Word of God every week. And you're going to learn what else God wants you to know. And you're going to get your perspective aligned again. And you're going to begin to enjoy the abundant life. Jesus talked about that. John 10, 10, I've come that they might have life and they might have it more abundantly. Mm -hmm. now, that's not, now that's not talking about exotic cars and European vacations and all that kind of stuff. That's, this is not the health and wealth gospel. That's a whole other message and that does not come from the Bible. That's right. That's right. But God wants you to have an abundant life. You know what an abundant life is? All your needs are met. Right. People asked me years ago, how will you ever know when you're wealthy? I said, when all my bills are paid and I don't owe anybody else except love. And you know, we got out of debt. We didn't know. We, we supported both sets of our parents every week financially. We didn't know that's one of the reasons why we got out of debt. When we got out of debt, we supported a pastor's family. He got in trouble. He, got, he had shoulder surgery and got addicted to a, a drug, and that led to marijuana, and that led to him on Easter Sunday night after preaching to a church that was around 3,000 at the time. He preached on Easter Sunday, Sunday morning. Sunday night, he was at Dunkin' Donuts trying to buy cocaine. And he got caught. He got arrested. You know the whole mess. Well, we supported his wife and two kids for a whole year because we got out of debt. We weren't the only ones that supported them, but we were able to help them because our needs are bad. You know, when the Bible talks about God will throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing, you won't have room enough for it. You want to know why that is? So you can help meet the needs of others, which is exactly what he read out of Acts 4. Right. Yeah. Yeah. But you've got to do what God says. Your obedience will determine your abundance. Proverbs 3, 9, 10. I love this verse. Honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of all your crops. Then your barns will be filled to overflowing, and your vats will brim over with new wine. Now you want to know how the average church member reads this? Watch this. That's how we read it. Once my barns are filled to overflowing, and my vats are brimming over with new wine, then I will bring the first fruits of my crops and honor the Lord with my wealth. That's how we read it. That's not what it says. Right? Well, if I win the lottery, Pastor, I'm gonna give I'm gonna give 10% to Potomac Valley Church. Really? By the way, in case you want to go to Vegas and triple the amount of money you give to God, or play the lottery so you can give vast amount of sums to God, you just need to know the Bible says we're to live our lives by choice, not by chance. And God's not interested in you throwing some dice to earn some money to build His kingdom. What He'd like you to do is throw down some of His Word and start doing what He says. Your obedience will determine your abundance. Here's number five. By the way, most people don't live the abundant life. They, they live the redundant life. You know what that is? The same thing over and over again. This year is just like last year. Some of you right now this morning, it just seems like your life's on a treadmill and you're not really getting anywhere and it's just the same old stuff. And, and you know, who, who would ever sign up for a marriage? I don't know how you do marriages here, but we used to have the bride come down the aisle and the groom would be here and, and the pastor would ask him some questions, have him exchange some vows, and they'd say, I do, and all that. Remember all that? Yeah. And then you get married and said, no, I didn't. But, but anyway, um, <laughs> what bride would walk down the aisle if the man she was about to marry said, listen, I'm, I'm never going to change and get better. What you see is what you get. This is it. What, man, what groom would marry a bride who said, I'm not going to change or improve at all my entire life. What you see is what you get. It's not going to get better. Some of you are in a marriage right now. And it's like, we're not going anywhere. We're not making any progress. Nothing's getting better. I don't know a married person alive who wouldn't want to be in a marriage that got better every week and got better every year. Say, is that possible? Yeah. So can you talk to my spouse? No. No. You work on you. You work on you. you. You become better. You become everything that God wants you to be. And you improve every week and watch what happens to your marriage. We're supposed to be living an abundant life. And trust me, you can. But you can only do it if you do it His way. Here's number five. The discipline of saving will be more important than the amount you save. The discipline of saving will be more important than the amount you save. Now remember I told you earlier that the, the Bible says we're supposed to not spend all of our money? Yeah. Listen to this verse, Proverbs 13, 11. Dishonest money dwindles away. By the way, that's gambling. Playing the lottery. 
stealing from your business account when you're on a business trip, taking something you shouldn't take, cheating somebody. Dishonest money dwindles away. You won't be able to keep it. But he who gathers it little by little makes it grow. See, over here, when you're not spending all your money and you put money in savings, something you, I, 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 there were times we were getting out of debt. I remember one time, I, I, all I had was a dollar. God is my witness, this is true. My daughter was with me. We went to Chase Bank because I'd made a commitment before God. I was going to pay, I was going to be a faithful tither no matter what. Why? Because I need God's wisdom and God's blessing. You, tithing's how you get under the spout where all of God's blessings come out. If, if you're not tithing, I'll say, say something about that in a minute. If you're not tithing, you're, you, you're blessing yourself. You're seeing right now the best that you can do. And you have no idea what God could do if you'd just be faithful and bring the whole tithe to God's house. So, but I've made a commitment to be a tither. If I'm going to get out of debt, I, got, I need God's wisdom, God's blessing. So I was going to tithe every week. I was going to pay down my debts every week. And I was going to put something in savings every week. Well, that particular week, I read the tithe check. And I paid our, our, our debt payments. And we had a bunch of them. And I had no money left. I mean, no money. And I found a, I found a dollar in a drawer. I don't know where it came from. And I decided, I was, because of discipline, I was going to go to Chase Bank. And so we pulled up there, and the girl came, and she said, Yes, sir, may I help you? And I said, I'd like to put this in my savings account if I can. She okay. And, you know, she pulled the box in. And I, she left her microphone on, but you could hear her. She walked away. <laughs> Ah, she's dying laughing. And my daughter's going, Dad, don't let that bother you. And I, and I turned to her and I said, that doesn't bother me at all. Because I said, I'm saving something every week and the day will come when I'll have more in savings than everybody in that bank does. Because it's the discipline, not the amount. Wow. Remember one time I, was, I found $5 in my desk. I don't know where it came from. You know, when I was in debt, I would always say, has someone been in my wallet? <laughs> Because it, it, it's like a 20 would disappear or something like that. Has somebody been in there? But when we got out of debt, it was like, where did that 100 come from? Oh, I'm serious. So I took that $5 over to Chase Bank, and I walked into the bank this time, and I told the lady, I said, I'd like to apply this to my mortgage. <laughs> Mr. Cameron. I said, yeah, I'd like to apply it to my mortgage. She goes, it's, it's $5, sir. And I don't know where this came from. But I said, well, ma'am, that's $5 less I will owe you on the principal, and it's also $5 less you can charge me interest on. That makes sense. On November 15, 2001, I walked into the bank, that same lady. I went in to make the final payment on my mortgage. And I had a guy there film it. I've got it on, I've got it on film. We filmed it. Because I'd never known anybody paid their house off, so I wanted to have a record of it. And when I walked in there and I made the last payment, she's... She's bawling her eyes out. There are tears on my mortgage where her, her, her tears smeared the signatures. Wow. And when I turned around, all the people in the bank were outside their office. They were all clapping for what I'd done because she told them what I was doing. Wow. And as it turns out, none of those people had their mortgages paid off. In fact, the president of Bank One in Texas met in my office and told me it was impossible to be debt-free, including your mortgage. I said, well, sir, my, my house is paid for. How do you do that? Not with the bank's wisdom, not with the wisdom of the world, the wisdom of God. Here's number six. God will grow. God will grow whatever you sow. Whatever seed you're sowing, God's going to grow. If you, want, if you want corn to grow, you've got to plant corn seed. If you want beans to grow, you've got to plant bean seed. Every farmer knows that. Yep. The Bible says, do not be deceived. Galatians 6, 7, God is not mocked. Whatever a man sows, that will he also reap. Luke 6, 38, give and it shall be given to you. We know all these verses. We just don't do it. Right? right? right. Come on. Come on. 2 Corinthians 9, 6, remember this. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. Whoever sows generously will also reap generously. What have you been sowing? I'm not just talking about money, but you, know, you, you, think you, can, you think you can cheat God and somehow get God to bless you? You think you, can, uh, you think you can cheat on your spouse and somehow God will bless your marriage? You think you can go out and, you know, the old timers used to say, people would go out during the week and sow wild oats and then come to church and pray for crop failure. <laughs> Doesn't work. God will grow whatever you sow. So if you're, growing, if you're sowing negativity, guess what's coming? If you're sowing strife and division, guess what's coming? 
If you're striving, uh, sell, uh, sowing, cheating, and stealing, guess what's coming? Now, now I'm not telling you your, 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 your name's going to be on the front page of USA Today or you're going to be on CNN, but, but someone's is every day, right? Because they thought they could sow the wrong stuff and somehow have the right kind of a harvest. No, it doesn't work that way. God will grow whatever you sow. In fact, the Bible says God will multiply it. Remember in the Bible, the, the first thing that God said to man, be fruitful and mul multiply? Did you know He told the animals to do the same thing? Be fruitful and multiply? Did you know everything in the universe multiplies, good and bad? Because God has set that into the, into the fabric of the universe. Yep. So that's why you want to be sowing the right seeds. Right. All right, here's the last one. Sustained generosity will be the guarantee for your sustained financial success. Sustained generosity. In other words, you can't just be generous once in your life, expect God to bless you all your life. It doesn't work that way. I mean, all you'd have to do is just take your wallet and just drop it in the giving box on your way out, right? Say, hey, man, I'm set. God's going to bless me now. No, that's not how it works. You've got to be generous all the time. Now, I'll tell you what's in that book. Those principles work. Not because it's my book, but because those are God's principles. All we did was apply it. All we are is satisfied customers. That's it. And, and, and we, we love to share it. I've traveled, I've traveled all over the place telling people this story. Because you know what? God's got enough for everybody. You're not going to run out. But, and it's not that we don't know what to do. In fact, some of these principles, as you've been seeing them, you're thinking, Pastor Will, you brought this guy to come up here and tell us this simple stuff? Yeah, because we don't do it. We know what we ought to do. James said to him that knows to do good and does it not, it's sin. So, so you got to learn to be generous. Now, by the way, tithing is not generous. Generosity. In your Bible, Matthew chapter 3, verse 10 says, Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. Test me in this. Only time in the Bible where God says, Test me! Test me! I want to show you what I can do! He doesn't say that about prayer. He doesn't say that about Bible study. He doesn't say that about anything except tithing. He says, Test me! I want to show you! I want to show you what I can do! But you know what? Most churches, they don't educate and motivate non-givers and they don't appreciate or cultivate the people who are giving. That's right. Potomac Valley Church is doing that. That's what all this stuff is about. People that aren't giving, educate, motivate. People that are giving, appreciate, cultivate. But by the way, tithing, God says, I'll, I'll, I'll throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing you don't have room enough for. That's not the best part. You know what the best part is? And by the way, for those people who say, well, that's an Old Testament thing, that's not in the New Testament, it's in the New Testament. Seven times the seventh chapter of Hebrews. It's in Matthew 23, 23. I call it the Michael Jordan verse. If you can remember Michael Jordan's number, you can find your way to this verse. Matthew 23, 23. Jesus rebuked the scribes and Pharisees. He said, you, you tithe, men, dill, and cumin, the smallest spices known to man. These were the religious legalists. They were tithing everything to make sure they were tithing before God. He said, but you have, you have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faithfulness. He said, you, you, you should have done that without neglecting these. He didn't say, oh no, you don't need to tithe. Why are you tithing? You don't need to tithe. But, but see, the best part is not that God throws up in the floodgates of heaven. You read a couple of verses later, it says, and he says, I will rebuke the devourer. You know who the devourer is? That's the devil. He says, if you'll be a faithful tither, I'll keep the devil from taking what you already have. Wow. I know this will this will bug some of you. But you remember back in 2008, 2010, remember the recession we were in? How things were terrible? Our church built a new 30-acre sports complex with a huge gymnasium with six different courts in it, uh, six soccer fields, three football fields, the largest sand pit volleyball court in the whole Dallas-Fort Worth area, and an amphitheater that would seat 8,000 people, and we did all that with cash. We also hired five staff members and gave, increased our money we gave to missionaries during a recession. Wow. Wow. So how in the world is that possible? David wrote in Psalm 37, 25, he said, I've been old, I've been young and I've been old, yet I've never seen the righteous forsaken yeah. or God's children begging bread. That's right. You know why? God's rebuking the devourer. And you get a church or you get a home or you get a business, you get a man, you get a woman, you get a young person who decides, I'm going to do what God says. 
God not only will provide for you, He will rebuke the devourer and keep the devil from taking what you already have. I don't care who sits in the White House. Yeah, I'd like to have a Bible-believing, Christian, godly man who got on his face every day and sought God's word. Yeah, I'd love to have all that. that. That'd all be one. I don't care whether it's the Republicans or the Democrats or whoever. That does not affect what God does in my life. What happens in my house and in God's house is more important than what happens in the White House. Yeah. Yep. That's right. And we should pray for all of our leaders and authority and pray that we can lead quiet and peaceful lives. But don't do that and ignore what God says about being a tither. Tithing is not generosity. Generosity is above that. I'm going to close with one, one story and I'm done. Every time whenever I go speak someplace, I always try to get home so I can have dinner with my family. You know, then next year will be my 50th year of ministry. There have been a lot of times I've been gone. I didn't miss any of my son's uh, ball games. I didn't miss any of my daughter's stuff growing up and all that. I always made sure I was there. But I've been gone a lot over 50 years. And now that I'm retired and I look back, I wish I could have been a part of a whole lot more. I have two grandsons now. They moved last June to Ohio. We were a part of everything in their life. Now they're, they're in another state. We're, we are going up there for, for Christmas, spend some days with them. But we're, we're, we're thinking about, do we move there? What, what are we going to do? Because we don't want to miss that. But so I always tried to get home. I'd always try to get a flight after I'd speak somewhere, wherever it is, anywhere in the country. When I was out of the States, it was a little harder to do, but I tried to get back there for dinner. And one Sunday afternoon, I got back, and, and this was back when they used to pick me up at the airport. They don't do that anymore. They make me drive my own car. And um, my wife picked me up. My two daughters were with me. We went to a fast food restaurant called On the Border. And we walked in, we sat down, we, we, we were getting ready to, we got our tea, the, the waitress came and waited on us, and one of my daughters said, our waitress is a single mom. And I go, how do you know that? And the other daughter goes, Dad, come on. I turned to Jan, I go, how do they know she's a single mom? She goes, Barry. Okay, whatever. <laughs> so we ate our meal, when our meal was done, I, uh, I said, hey, since it's so obvious that our waitress is a single mom. You want to bless her? And they go, yeah, let's do it. Now, in our family, what blessing someone means, we, we all carry folded up $100 bills. When we got out of debt, I went and cashed a check for $2,000 at the bank, came home, and before, it was on Christmas Eve, and I had all these $100 bills, and my family's eyes were so big, and they, they thought, this is so great. And, and I said, I want you to fold these up, and we're going to give these away at our Christmas Eve service. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to, this was the first Christmas after we got out of debt. And I said, I want you to just pray and ask God, wherever you're going, just pray. God, who, should, who could use a blessing? Who could I give this to? And I said, God will show you people. And then you just give them that $100 bill. Well, what if they ask us why we're giving it to them? You just say, if they say they, they want to thank whoever gave it, you just say, well, I'll let them know. That's fine. And I said, then we'll come home. And after the Christmas Eve service, we'll, we'll um, talk about it. So we did that first Christmas Eve Service. I think we had two of them that night. We came back Christmas Eve. We're sitting at our table, and there's the Christmas tree. We haven't opened a single gift. And every member of our family is telling stories of people that they, the Lord laid on their heart to give $100 to, and the stories were unbelievable. And we were all crying. On Christmas Eve, you're not supposed to cry on Christmas Eve. We were crying, how we'd bless people. And the story, my, my youngest daughter had gone up to a real, she said, a big man with big muscles. And she goes, he started crying. Another daughter gave a, a $100 to a single mom, and my wife gave the same lady $100, and I saw her in the hallway, and I gave her $100. So she burst into tears, and I go, what's wrong? She goes, you're the third person who's giving me $100. Like, well, God must have really wanted to bless you. So I said, you want to really bless her? I go, what does that mean? So I pulled $300 bills out of my wallet. And you know that leather thing they have where they put your bill in there? And, and, and the bill was $24. I remember that. And so, and she said, are, are you all set to go? I said, yes, ma'am. So she started to walk away, and we were putting our coats on to walk away. And she comes back to the table. She goes, sir, 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 you, you made a mistake. And I, I, I said, well, what do you mean I made a mistake? She goes, well, I think you thought these were three $10 bills. I said, no, ma'am, I'm... No, I, no I, I know what they are. That's $300, sir. I said, I know, ma'am. We, uh, we want to bless you tonight. And she backed up. She said, why would you want to bless me? And I said, well, because we're Christians. Yeah. 
Didn't tell her I was a pastor. I didn't invite her to our church. I know I get F's on both of those. But here's what you need to know. It's not about that. That comes later. And she goes, you need to come back and sit down. Okay. So we sat back down at the table. Dirty dishes. She goes, I got to tell you a story. She said, I'm a single mom. I said, obviously. No, I didn't say that. <laughs> I didn't say that. I didn't say that. She goes, see that little boy over there? She goes, that's my son. She said, I hope he doesn't bother you tonight. And he didn't bother us. He knocked over a sugar dispenser, spilled a drink, did some other stuff. But he didn't really bother us. She, she said, when I got ready to come to work today, my babysitter didn't show up. And she said, if I, don't, if I don't work, I can't pay my bills. And she said, I called my boss and I told him my babysitter didn't show up. And he goes, that's not my problem. You either be here at 5 o'clock, you're fired. She goes, I, I, and she goes, I just, I, I cried out to God. And she said, I just started going back to church. I said, God, what am I supposed to do? And she said, so I started punching numbers, called my boss. He was still on the phone. And she goes, listen, there's a little, there's a little area right there at the restaurant. I could put my son over there and I'll, I'll watch him, but I, I'll do all my customers. If you just let me do that tonight, I'll, I'll find a new babysitter. And the boss said, okay. But if he bothers any of our customers, you're going to be fired on the spot. She goes, that's why I wanted to know if he'd bothered you. We said, no, he didn't. And anyway, so we got up and said goodbye. She hugged all of us. And we were in the car driving home, and I was driving, and my wife was next to me, and my oldest daughter and, and my youngest daughter, Kelly, was in the back. And we're driving. There's no music on. And I don't know why, but maybe the Lord wanted it that way. And she goes, Dad, could I ask a question? I said, sure, Kelly, what is it? She said, Dad, were, were we the only Christians who ate in that restaurant tonight? And the Holy Spirit settled in our car. I said, no, honey, I, I don't think we were the only Christians that ate there. Not another word was spoken all the way home. But the most powerful sermon I've ever heard on generosity. You see, what that lady should have told us was, oh, listen, you need to say, I got, I'll, I'll be right back. And she brings a purse out, and I'm like, look at all this money. Do you know how many Christian people in this restaurant tonight have blessed me and to help my little boy? I mean, I think we're going to be able to move out of our apartment and get into a nice little... We're so overwhelmed. And, and I've just gone back to church and there's no God like God. And I've been telling everybody in the restaurant, if you don't know God, you need to know God. God's unbelievable. That wasn't the story. And you know why that wasn't the story? Because we're not as generous as we need to be. So, Pastor... I can't be. I don't have. You're right. You don't. Because you haven't done this. But what happens when we all start doing this? There's an old song we used to sing when we all get to heaven. What a day of rejoicing that will be. That's not about you feeling so good to be in heaven. That's going to be about all the people who are there because you helped get them there. And generosity is an incredible place to start. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for all of these folks who are here today. and God, we thank you for your word. Thank you for the way you provide for us. You love us. And God, you tell us exactly what we need to do to have your blessing in our life. And God, help us to do it your way. I pray for every man, woman, boy, and girl within the sound of my voice. That God, today you would stir in their heart. It's time. It's time to start managing your money in a way that honors me. And God, I pray for everyone who doesn't have a book, they'll get one. I pray, that, I pray that every single person would buy one of these workbooks and start going down, checking the boxes, doing all the stuff, because every one of us can do it, God. Doing your will is not hard if we just do it your way. And God, I just pray that you would bless every single person who, who is deciding to follow your principles in their life when it comes to their finances. And God, I pray you will bless them the way you blessed Janice and me and Katie and Chip and Johnny and Matt and Lindley and Will and Levi. And God, that they would be just as overwhelmed as we are by what an awesome God you are. And God, I pray for this great church as they put your principles into work when it comes to the finances of this church. That, God, you would literally rip open the floodgates of heaven and pour out such a financial revival on this church that they would run out of dreams before they ever run out of resources again. And, God, we'll give you all the glory. In Jesus' name I pray. 
Amen. Thank you. All right. Here we go. Oh my goodness. I, I, I'm just so convicted, so inspired, so moved by everything that Barry shared. Um, thank you, brother. Thank you for what you shared. It just moved our hearts. Everybody that I couldn't even look back because I'd be messed up. But I looked across and Tasha and Angela were all crying. We're just thank you for pouring out your heart, but living the life. And I really appreciate just your example. And I'm grateful for the friendship and you're a straight talker. So I really, really, really appreciate you, man. I'm grateful that we get this opportunity as a church to gather, to be able to have communion together. And uh, I'm just going to share some very brief thoughts for us uh, for communion. I want to invite you to turn on over to uh, Luke chapter 18. We're just going to stay in this one passage and uh, in Luke 18. And we're going to talk about God's grace, not our goodness. And uh, because it is about God's grace and not our goodness. The longer I live, the more aware I am of my need for God's grace and the more aware I've become that there's no good thing in me or anyone else but just God's grace. There's this young man, a certain ruler in verse 18 that asked him, asked Jesus, he said, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good? Jesus asked. No one is good except God alone. Now this is really important because Jesus and God are one. But this young man was asking what good thing he needed to do to inherit eternal life. And really, there's no good thing that we can do to inherit eternal life. Eternal life is the gift of God. It is God's grace. It has nothing to do with our goodness. So we should be generous because we're expressing our love for God and we want to be like God in the world but be really clear about this nothing you do will get you into heaven you and I we can't do anything to save ourselves and Jesus goes on to explain this by, by breaking it down a little bit further in verse 20 it goes on it says you know the commandments do not commit adultery do not murder do not steal do not give false testimony honor your father and mother all these I've kept since I was a boy, he said. Then Jesus heard this, and he said to him, you, st you still lack one thing. Sell everything you have and give it to the poor, and you'll have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. When he heard this, he became very sad because he was a man of great wealth. And Jesus looked at him and said, How hard is it, is it for the rich to enter the kingdom of heaven? Indeed, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Those who heard this asked, who then can be saved? Because in their first century context, their understanding of God's blessing was that God blessed the rich and cursed the poor. That it was, it was a sign. And so, so they thought, man, if this guy has everything and he, it, it, he can hardly be saved, how can anybody make it? And Jesus says this in verse 27, and this is a key passage for us. As we understand this, Jesus replied, what is impossible with men is possible with God. You see, the truth is this morning, we cannot save ourselves. It is impossible for us to save ourselves. But it is absolutely called for us to embrace the one thing that can, which is God's grace. That is the message of the cross. That is the message of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. It is a message that God's grace, a message of God's grace, not of our goodness. So every time we gather, and we've been doing this for 2,000 years. We've done this in small groups of one and two. We've done this in caves. We've done this in cathedrals. We've done this in sanctuaries. We've done this in stadiums. We have gathered as believers and believers in all the time zones that you can think of and that exist are gathering or have gathered to be, to be able to remember that we couldn't do anything to save ourselves. But God did everything to save us. God's love for us 
His generosity is what should inspire our generosity. But when you understand that God is a generous God, you're not looking for reasons to exclude someone from salvation. You're looking for reasons to invite people to embrace God's salvation. You're looking for reasons to connect with people, to engage with people, to draw people in. And that's why I got to tell you, I was, I'm so moved by this passage. I've been reflecting on it, preparing to speak to you. And I'm so moved by how the Holy Spirit used Barry to really convict all of our hearts. Because some of us might think about things like financial freedom as if it is something for us. So I won't have a burden on me anymore instead of me being a blessing to others. And that's really what it's about. Some of us think about salvation like that. Like I get to get a ticket to heaven. I'm good, but it's not about your salvation. We are saved so that we can share God's love. We are saved because God wants to save us because he loves us. But this man, though he had lived such a morally upstanding life in the eyes of people, he still had money as his God. He still was unable to get past that. But Jesus says, it's possible. And I believe it's possible for all of us because Jesus made it possible. So wherever you are today, and there are so many of you that are visiting for the first time or the second or third time, we're just happy you can be a part of our family. We're so grateful that you would come and, and worship with us. We pray that you can make this church your home. But we wanna let you know what we teach it's really simple. That's why I appreciate what Barry shared. Barry, that's how we are. We're, it's just that simple. You need to believe, you need to repent, you need to get baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. So you might receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. That's, that's what we teach. If you can follow five fingers, you can follow where we're going. And we teach that we need to extend our arms to those on the right as much as to those on the left. We love all people because God loves us. Because what seems impossible with men is possible with God because God has a plan to redeem all of his people to be with him and that plan began with Jesus going to the cross to have his body broken so that we could be made whole and his blood spilt so we could be forgiven this story is not about us this is a church of messed up people all the, everybody that's visiting doesn't know. In case you, you, if you were looking for the good church, you didn't find the good church. You found the messed up people church. This is not about our goodness. We're not particularly good people. We're not, I'm not. I'm just letting you know. But God is good. And he's been good to us. And every Sunday we celebrate his goodness. And we seek to be a little bit more like him. Amen? Let's go to God in a word of prayer. Our God and Father, you are so kind to us. From coast to coast, from one end of the horizon to the other, you have blessed us in so many ways. God, you brought our brothers and sisters from Indonesia to give us wisdom and insight. You brought our brother from Texas today to give us wisdom and insight, God. You, you brought our brothers and sisters from all over the world to give us insight. You've, you brought our friends and our neighbors, your own children from all over the planet and all over these United States to be able to be here to worship today. God, you drew people here. There were so many people I met from so many different places that just found us online this morning, God. I'm so grateful that they're here visiting with us. And I pray, God, that your Holy Spirit truly inspires them to be all of what you want them to be. I pray for all of us who call this church home already, God, that we can be reflections of your love this Christmas, that we will be a, a, a beacon of light, of generosity to so many and that it begins with us taking this wafer that represents your son's body, his body that was broken, so that we might be made whole and so that we might bring heaven to this earth and help to make our communities whole again. So many broken families, so many broken communities, so many broken promises, but your broken body, it, it gives us the hope to bind up the wounds of your people. God, we thank you for this juice that represents your son's blood, spilt for our forgiveness, spilt for all of what we couldn't do for ourselves, evidence of your grace, your life's blood coming out of you so that we could have life poured into us. We thank you for this. 
We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Outstanding. So proud of uh, so many of our teens that served us today. They're ushering today. If you, you see the teens, give it up for the teens. And you know, it's amazing how the Holy Spirit moves. Uh, we had a, 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 an announcement to share with you uh, that came from one of our college students, Rowan. And uh, Rowan is uh, collecting uh, 20 uh, gloves and hats um, to be able to give to children, particularly elementary kids that are in need. And so we want to ask you if you have some gloves and hats or if you want to go and purchase gloves and hats to be able to contribute to that, please bring those next Sunday and Rowan will have a table out front ready to receive those gloves and hats. Uh, so please uh, see her. We're really proud of her. She grew up here in our church and she has a heart to really be able to serve people. Amen. So great, great job, Rowan. And don't forget to bring her gloves and hats next week, right? Amen. All right. I've got a few things to talk to you, a few of my favorite things to talk to you about. Um, first and foremost, I want to encourage you, let's share his story this Christmas. So let's share our faith, right? And, uh, and one of the great opportunities to do that is next Saturday. Uh, December the 10th at 10 o'clock, um, the Christmas Day Parade, just like Marcus said, will start here, the Dumfries Christmas Day Parade. And so we are committed to really being engaged in our local community. I want to invite you to come here uh, wearing your POVA t-shirt. Definitely make sure you're bundled up unless you don't need to be bundled up. We know I met some people in the, in the, in the audience that they, they're like, what cold weather? This is nothing. So, um, but, uh, but it, you want to wear your POVA swag, love for you to come out, put on a Christmas hat. Come ready. We're going to hand out um, some invitations to the Christmas service as we're part of the Christmas Day Parade. Uh, the mayor specifically said, Pastor Will, make sure you invite everyone to your church. And I was like, this is the first time in my life an elected official is telling me to invite everybody to church. And I was like, okay. So I want to honor the governing authorities by inviting everyone in the town of Dumfries to church. Sure. But we'll also hand out candy canes. So sugar and Jesus for everyone. <laughs> Just a little bit of sugar, just not too much. All right, also next Sunday, as Marcus mentioned, December 11th at 11, we'll be right here. Christmas uh, cookie contest. Lexi and, and Cynthia are ready to defend their throne, but I already talked to some people in the crowd that are bringing some heat. So even just from the announcements, Marcus has already stirred up some controversy. And, uh, and also ugly sweater contests. I know some of you are committed. Sean is a man who's committed to sweaters. So I'm sure Sean is gonna bring, Sean's got an ugly sweater or two, right? He, you, you normally have good sweaters. Um, but uh, he, he mentioned that to me. He's always like encouraging my sweater swag. So I wore my sweater today to honor my brother Sean. Want to see if you have an ugly sweater or if you can make one. And if you can, you have a chance to be the reigning Potomac Valley ugly sweater contest 22 winner. Amen. And then let's just make sure that as we're going into the holiday season, that we really are spreading uh, his love 
this Christmas. I'm going to close this out in a word of prayer. As you're making your way right out the, the exit door there, I do want to let you know we do have some invitations. Uh, they, they're both in English and Spanish. For the Christmas service, please invite your friends and neighbors to come so we can worship God together. Amen. And uh, we really look forward to having a great worship next Sunday, having the kids up here performing. It's going to be absolutely, absolutely amazing. Um, and I'm going to go right now in a word of prayer. There are two prayer requests that we have. Um, Alma Carter uh, is, um, is, is having a procedure done, so we want to be praying for Alma. Many of you know the details for Alma. And also, um, our neighbor, Emmanuel, uh, he, has, he just got diagnosed. We're at the exact same age. He just got diagnosed with leukemia, and uh, he just started his uh, chemotherapy this week. And, and I asked him, and he said, yeah, if you can ask your church to pray for me. So, uh, so let's, let's go to God in a word of prayer. God, I know there's so many, so many requests. There's so many um, long-term illnesses that we're battling with, uh, situations that we're struggling through. I do pray, God, that you will be with Alma, God, and with her procedure, God, that you can uh, just really strengthen her body, every molecule of her body, God, uh, every, every fiber of her being, God, strengthen her. God, please be with the Carters in a great way, God. Encourage them. They are a family that give everything. They are so generous, so kind. Uh, Alma is, is, is documenting everything about all of our lives all the time. And uh, we're so grateful for her love and for her generosity, God. We pray your blessing on her, on her physical body, God, and that you strengthen her in her inner being. God, I pray for my neighbor, Emmanuel, God, that you can uh, help him, God. He's got a young family. Uh, God, please, God, just be with him. He, he seems healthy on the outside, but he's got leukemia. God, I pray, God, that you can be with him. God, be, please be with the doctors, the nurses. Please be with him this whole month as he goes through chemo, intensive chemo all month long, God. Uh, strengthen him, God. Uh, God, in his inner being, God, uh, uh, strengthen every molecule in his body, God, and, and be with him, God. I know there are many others that, that are battling situations that, that, that are in our family, in our, in our congregation, uh, that are in our extended family, God, in our community. Uh, God, please be with them. God, thank you for today. Thank you for blessing us. Thank you for blessing us. God, as Barry preach, God. He said that pastors are a blessing. Barry is a pastor who is a blessing to us today. God, may we be blessings to others as we learn to be free from, from anything and uh, so that we can be generous in every way. God, thank you for your mercy and grace. I pray your peace on all of your people. I pray your, pray your peace on all the people who have come to gather with us, God. Those who are, are ready uh, your disciples already Christians, God, I pray that they'll be strengthened in their faith. Those who haven't yet made the decision to make Jesus Lord, I pray, God, that they can get connected and make that decision to be with you, God, and make that decision to make Jesus Lord of their life. God, you have been so good to us and so gracious to this church. Bless us and may this month be a month where we excel in our love for you and our love for our community. And I pray, God, that you bless all that we do. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Don't forget to hit up Pova Java. There's a cup of coffee waiting for you. And make sure you get an invitation. Love you guys.